I would like to start out by welcoming you to um, the um, standardizing beneficiary definitions in mine action in practice. Um, and uh, many of you will have been aware of the stand the guide to standardizing beneficiary definitions uh, that was uh, that was prepared by a, a coalition of organizations uh, who identified this as a as a gap in mine action. Um, and we are today, there was a launch uh, not so long ago uh, of the guide. And today we're looking at um, being able to see what's happened since the launch of the guide um, to be able to have hopefully a quick overview of what the guide is about and then uh, have a bit of a discussion. The idea is that this side event will be a little bit in the um, format of a bit of a talk show generally, except for our, our initial presentation. Um, and the rest of it will be a discussion, a question and answer discussion. And I do believe we also have some um, interventions uh, from the floor uh, that are planned as well. Um, so we'll see how that works out, uh, given the fact that our technology may or may not uh, be uh, uh, cooperating with us today. I'd like to start off um, with Sebastian Kasak, who uh, is having some difficulties joining us, as I mentioned. Um, and Sebastian has been one of the leading uh, forces behind the production of this um, standardizing beneficiary definitions uh, document. Um, he joined MAG in 2016 as a senior community liaison advisor and has worked uh, for many years in mine action, uh, more than two decades. Many of you will know him. Um, we, following that, um, I'd like to introduce um, Shafiullah Amadzai, who is from um, DMAC in Afghanistan, the National Authority. Um, and he will be giving to us uh, in our first section of the, uh, of the event, uh, uh, the National Authority perspective from Afghanistan. Um, he is uh, someone who has been uh, in humanitarian work for some time, and he now leads the quality management department at the Directorate of Mine Action Coordination, DMAC, in Afghanistan. Um, we also have another National Authority representative. Uh, we have Lee Panarith, who's from uh, the Cambodian Mine Action Authority. Um, and uh, Lee Rith was also the former executive director of the ASEAN Regional Mine Action Center from 2017 to 2020, and has been a deputy secretary general of the Cambodian uh, Mine Action and Victim Assistance Authority since 2014. So we're very happy to have you with us, um, Rith. Rounding out our first section, we have um, Katharina Dolazek from, um, who is desk officer for humanitarian mine action in the Division of Humanitarian Assistance Operation at the German Federal Foreign Office. And uh, Kathleen, Katharina joined the GFFO in 2018, um, and she uh, has also a master's degree in law, um, and now we're very pleased is working on mine action. Um, I introduced the first part of the panel, so why don't we stop there for the moment um, and um, we'll hand over to Sebastian and we'll start with uh, our first uh, section of the panel who I've now introduced. So Sebastian, can I ask you to kick off with an overview of the standard beneficiaries uh, guide, please? With pleasure after a heart attack. Greetings <laughs> from uh, Seoul, Korea, almost midnight here. Um, so, standardizing beneficiary definitions has been on our agenda since 2015 16 uh, when we started to write the first guide. Um, it was three NGOs um, Halo, MAG, and NBA at the time. And um, do we have the presentation up? I can't see it right now. Just to know. Slide is up. Okay. So, you see on the right side um, the the three organizations that started it, and then we uh, it was accepted by the UK by by other donors as well as as really good guidance, and they built it into their their proposals and grants, and we started uh, sharing the idea at one of the NDMs I think three years ago, and then we felt okay with practice we have lessons learned we really want to discuss it and how useful it is to standardize uh, these definitions and we met with the um, other four um, ngos you see on the screen um, dca ddg 
uh, HI and FSD. And um, we asked the, the UN to join and Geneva Center to join and ICRC to join and everyone came. And that was 10 February last year. And then just before COVID basically um, changed our world, we still met in person and um, we managed to, to develop the guidance jointly. And um, as publishers, we the, the seven INGOs are now signing up for it, but you will hear in the event today that we are going towards uh, integration into IMAS, um, making some good steps forward. The initial um, definitions on risk education and on uh, land release were um, adopted already in IMAS 5.10 on the information management. And um, that's the same route we will take uh, now, but you will hear from, from others presenting on this. So next slide, please. Um, we, we added actually two uh, chapters into the second version on um, EOD, Explosive Ordnance Disposal, and on uh, victim assistance. So linked to the new IMAS 13.10, which at the moment is offline, but will come back um, soon, I think, uh, with a few more Im improvements and really worth um, working on that. And so we have four sections now on, uh, on the definitions. Um, it's not just definitions, but it provides guidance how to use these uh, um, beneficial definitions. And um, I'll take us through um, a few of those. But before I do, um, why do we need uh, these definitions? It really helps for transparency. Um, if we look especially into impact, um, our work, who is benefiting from it, um, we, we use the same um, approaches across the board. And that's within the country, the different operators should agree, sit together. And we, we are striving for the national mine action authorities to take them up, to include them into national mine action standards uh, as their own um, guidance. And, and this will help across the sector to be more fair, more transparent. Partnership is the, one of the topics uh, for this event. So to really work in partnership, to work together and um, not against each other. Um, Important is the translation into local languages, and that will be my, my final point on this opening. We already have quite a few ready, and we're working on more, and this will help to really localize it and use these uh, definitions. Um, so next slide are the principles. We um, highlight here that start with the commensurate. We shouldn't spend too much time in really counting and doing all this monitoring work and so on, because we want to do um, risk education, we want to do um, land release, we want to do victim assistance, etc. cetera. Yeah? Um, so it has to be commensurate in resources and time we spend for this uh, task. Um, so basically saying we are not scientists, uh, you don't expect that detail, but we are trying to be as precise as we can. Um, they need to be realistic um, and context um, adapted. So. Maybe that's a contradiction to be context specific, but um, overall, we do want, um, they have to re re reflect the way, for example, um, a country is uh, measuring how many people go to the health services. If one country does it per day, the daily rate, another country maybe uses weekly rates and so on. So we need to uh, apply local um, ways they are um, counting uh, different um, yeah, these, these different aspects. Um, transparent, I already mentioned, like we want to avoid duplication. And, and if there is a case of duplication, then uh, we want to be transparent about it and explain why this is the case. And um, I'll just say, for example, in risk education, it's quite normal, um, or in EOD as well, the same households may be benefiting from various tasks and uh, from hopefully attending various risk education sessions. So these are some of the principles and um, disaggregated is a key, SADD, and we um, sex and age uh, disaggregated uh, data, but also disability. So that's the third D. And we, we try to apply and give guidance how to um, do disability oriented uh, data collection and just uh, don't have much time and I want to keep it short, but we are suggesting to use the Washington Group short set. 
that's a globally accepted approach for people from six years and above. And at least it gives an initial indication and it works in individual interviews and in household level interviews. It will not work in other settings. Um, let's move on to the next slide. So risk education. Um, we are suggesting to use three main categories of risk education, interpersonal, mass and digital media, EORE, and uh, last training of trainers. So these three areas, um, that's different to the initial guidance because we are saying um, the message of the risk education is reaching from one person to the other. And that's the case also in mass media, even though it will be difficult to, to uh, we can't really count how many people are benefiting, but at least we can estimate it by using um, radio data, by looking at the reach um, of a television station and so on. So we know that we can't always be precise and count, but at least then let's estimate and explain how we got this data. Um, I don't want to go into much detail because in the end, just want to make you curious and please go into the guidance and, and maybe one aspect. So we are not counting um, the uh, when leaflets, yeah? how many people in average read a leaflet or look at a poster. So we don't uh, want that. We are saying um, report how many you are distributing, but don't count them as beneficiaries. Also in risk education, we don't want to count indirect beneficiaries because we say it gets too blurry, too, uh, we can't really control it. So um, no indirect beneficiaries from our suggestion in risk education. Next slide um, goes straight into land use, but this topic is about land release. And so the, the direct uh, beneficiaries in, in land release uh, are people who whose lives and limbs are protected because they, um, after a clearance, they can use the land uh, without fear uh, from getting injured and killed. So not the whole um, big, big grand family, but yes, the household that is living with this family, um, we would count as direct beneficiaries. Um, and to have a, a baseline, how to count indirect beneficiaries, then we are suggesting to use the smallest administrative unit close to this task, close to these uh, mind areas. And um, so you dis deduct the number of direct beneficiaries from the total of this uh, village or two villages if it's um, overlapping areas, and then you have your indirect beneficiaries. Um, the six land use categories are on the screen. Um, it works globally. We have really tried it in many, many settings. And yes, some people may say there's no land use, but if there's no land use, then there's also no beneficiary. Yeah. Um, maybe it changes over time, um, desert and borders and people start fleeing and then it uh, changes the use, but we did not anticipate that type of land use at the time we did the clearance. Yeah. So um, please study the, the different um, six areas and like sometimes it's not so easy to count, like access on a road, how many people are really using this road regularly, frequently, how do you define that? And that's why we need to sit together as a um, stakeholder group and agree on the ways we, we count in the country setting. Um, moving on to the area of victim assistance. Um, we, we know that the role of many operators is fairly limited towards victim assistance. Not that many in the mine action arena are really providers of services, you know? um, but we do play a role and that's pretty much what the IMS 1310 is about. So collecting data, referring um, victims, that's what we should document as well and, and count and show that this work is important and it leads to advocacy and, and that's how we are defining um, the beneficiaries and victim assistance. Um, I want to keep it short, just make you a bit curious what it is. So let's give, give you an example. A person receiving a prosthetic device is obviously a direct beneficiary, but also we want to include the other household members, um, in this case, indirect beneficiaries. So if you see 
a person going through a victim assistance may go through different stages from medical support, uh, psychosocial support to uh, prosthetics. Um, it's still the same person, but we do want to segregate, as we did for risk education, the type of um, services uh, to be that they are receiving. Last um, is the EOD. Um, how to count uh, benefits from EOD. EOD is not the same as land release. It's a risk reduction, risk management um, approach, which is not systematic for an entire area to a certain depth and so on. We are removing single items. So it is about the person who reports these items and their household members. They did the right thing, they informed us and they are safe now. Um, it's the people who could not go to school because that school is blocked, there's a booby trap, um, they can't use it after the end of conflict. And um, so these are also direct beneficiaries. And um, we define also indirect beneficiaries and that's sometimes hard to count uh, like in a big urban setting. Um, and we are suggesting to use the, the blast range and the population density in cases where it's really um, a lot of people and hard to, to um, count. So for detail, again, please look into the guidance itself. So last, last, we had an online event launch 24 November, 150 people online. Um, we have shared the guidance and, and uh, submitted it to the IMAS review board for a discussion. And um, this will be a topic today. Uh, we have done translations and I promised to say that. So Russian is almost ready. Arabic is done, French is done, Spanish is done, uh, Bosnian, Croatian, Serbian is uh, ready, Lao, final draft, Khmer started, um, Portuguese, final draft, and Vietnamese is done. So that's in total 12 languages plus two, I didn't mention, Dari and Farsi are on the list, but I'm not sure um, how far our Afghan uh, colleagues are. Maybe we can get this update um, today. As I said, um, the National Mine Action Authorities will endorse it. Donors endorse it, use it. We will hear uh, from Germany today. So um, looking forward to the contributions now. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sebastian, uh, for that overview and um, going through it quickly. We're a little bit behind time, so we'll have to try and uh, catch up a little bit. Um, but I do see that there start to be some questions coming in. We will take um, we will take those questions um, at the end uh, after we've uh, managed to have some of the presentations or uh, input from our panel. Um, so if you could just be patient, uh, we will make sure that uh, that all the questions are acknowledged somehow. If not during our event, then uh, then we will take them afterwards. Not to worry. Um, I would first like to um, move on to asking our first question uh, to um, Shafi Ulao from Afghanistan, from DMAC. Um, Shafi, I wonder, as, uh, as head of quality management, um, could you tell us um, why you feel that this document is important? Thank you very much, Sammy. Uh, I believe uh, it is uh, indeed very important because it helps add a layer of consistency in how we define our beneficiaries. Uh, while I was working with the risk education, we had a similar problem where we ran into some data related problems. And uh, the only way we could solve it by, was by defining our beneficiaries, defining the programs uh, they are reached through. So, uh, yeah, it does uh, also help provide um, a platform where all relevant stake stakeholders, uh, including the donors, agree on who direct and indirect beneficiaries are. And uh, it, and it has been a long time, and, and I think it's uh, long due that we, we start standardizing these direct and indirect beneficiaries because uh, every national authority has a different perspective on it and is defining it differently. Um, also, it, 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 it will help us um, plan and prioritize in the future because we would understand what the problem is, is uh, actually is in the communities, who it is affecting and who will benefit from potential intervention of mine action. 
but uh, again, I, I also uh, I also see some uh, more work to be done in it to to be um, um, something that is compliant with IMAS as well, because we do have certain um, linkages uh, con concerning definitions of beneficiaries in in, in IMAS and. IMAS is something that all national authorities uh, duly follow and adapt. So if, if uh, more work is uh, done towards it uh, and, and uh, national authorities are involved um, and brought onto the table to discuss um, this, I, I wouldn't want to go into details, but I, I have noticed some um, problems with this document, although it's a very good document to begin with, uh, but uh, that, that remains a discussion for another time, I believe, where all national authorities are, are um, sitting uh, in one round table and discussing this. Thank you so much, Shafi, and I think you've pointed to uh, to quite a few interesting issues, this issue of inconsistency with, with IMAS, and we'll come back to that one for sure. Um, I'd just like to move on, and um, if I could now uh, pass the floor to Katharina to talk a little bit about uh, the donor perspective on standardizing beneficiaries, because I think this was uh, the donor perspective was a key impetus behind this development of this guide. Over to you, Katharina. Thank you, Tammy. I hope that you can all hear me well. So, um, first of all, thank you very much for inviting Germany to the site event on standardizing beneficiary definitions. So, also from our perspective, this initiative is very important for the mine action sector because it provides a framework for harmonization of reporting beneficiaries. So donors, for example, us, we can see at one glance who will benefit directly and indirectly from projects we fund um, by going through the project documents. And especially um, standardization of beneficiary definition provides a reference document. So your document, it provides a reference document which we can consider when we assess proposals. So first and foremost, Mine action needs to support people in need, and in our case, those are usually among the most vulnerable due to the threat posed by explosive ordnance. And the work, your work, it focuses on many different aspects. The pillars of mine action that Sebastian mentioned, um, for example, clearance and survey, risk education, victim assistance, but also explosive ordnance disposal. It then considers criteria which are quite important for us as donors as well. It considers gender, age, disabilities, which are also needed not only for delivering mine action activities, but also to evaluate how to best deliver humanitarian assistance afterwards and maybe also connect them to other measures once an area has been cleared, for example, to development or to um, further stabilization um, projects. And all of these further activities, from our perspective, needs to be tailored to the population's needs. So when I read the standardizing beneficiary definitions, um, there were three questions which came into my mind and which I would like to raise here as well. So first, um, partly, partly statement, partly question. Um, from the German perspective, including the Washington, set, uh, Washington Group set of questions for people with dis disabilities is a very good uh, measure. In proposals, we ask for disaggregated data on gender, age, and disabilities. However, I noticed that sometimes data for um, the share of people with uh, disabilities particularly is oftentimes not available. So um, according to, um, to the Washington um, group set of questions, or the Washington group set of questions are developed in a way that people who may not even know that they have any um, disability or that they are in some way impaired, that they can um, that they can find it out with the questions posed by organizations. And therefore, I wonder how you apply the set of questions within programs and where do you, organizations and national authorities, see opportunities for improvement? So this maybe also goes a bit for you, um, Shafi. Um, second, this initiative has been proposed by a very diverse group um, with many different participants. The definitions have been translated into French and to other languages. So how 
do the organizations like the core groups that um, develop the standards? How do you further approach national and local organizations to approach the standardized definitions and also to gather data to serve the needs of people who are affected by explosive, explosive ordinance? And last, um, I would like to know if you see a need to advance and update the standardized beneficiary definitions. At the moment, um, I think the last version is from November 2020, so it's not that old. Um, but still, how much need do you see for any updates um, and how do you um, or do you expect anything from donors and national authorities regarding this, um, this definitions? So with these questions, I will now end my intervention and I'm looking forward to the further discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Katerina. That was uh, that was very helpful to have the donor perspective. I think what we'll do is um, we'll ask uh, Lori from HI when she does intervene to perhaps address some of the questions on victim assistance, and uh, she'll be talking about next steps. So um, we we'll, we can hopefully get her to answer uh, your questions when she when she intervenes in the next component, if that's okay. Just because we're running uh, short on time. Um, before we hand over to Laurie um, and, uh, and the rest of our panel, I wonder if we could now go to look a little bit at um, how uh, this guide is being implemented in the field. Um, and I wonder if I could uh, first hand over to, um, to Maya Chi Hong from, um, from MAG. Uh, who has been working for a long time. Uh, she's been working for 14 years and is a community liaison manager, has obviously loads of experience and is now going to um, bring us uh, a few examples from the field about how the, this guide is being implemented. Over to you, Maichi. Yeah, thank you, uh, Tami. Thank you for inviting me to the event. I am uh, the community liaison manager of my advisory group in Vietnam. Uh, MAC has been working in Vietnam since 1999. Today we have over 730 staff working in Quang Tri and Quang Binh provinces to clear the deadly legacy of the war. MAC conducts vector clearance, area clearance, cluster munition clearance, technical survey, non-technical survey, and explosive ordnance brick education. The community liaison teams are at the center of Orange MAC operations. They work ahead of the technical survey and clearance team to create linkages between operations and the communities. CL team are an essential component of beneficiary identification and therefore counting. The standard uh, beneficiary definitions were highly expected and welcome in our program. They facilitated building a common framework between operators and reporting to the donors. In addition, they help us to avoid double counting or inconsistency. The second version further provided guidance for all activities conducted, such as EOIE, EOD support tasks, land release, and victim assistance. And how it is applied in MAC Vietnam? It is a part of the consortium work with NPA, CRS, and more recently, Peace Tree Vietnam. The key documents have been available in Vietnamese since last year. They are fully applied for EOIE, and uh, they are adapted for land release and EOD support us. It is important that the um, standard beneficiary definition remain standard with the possibility to adapt to its context. Uh, let me to give you an example. Here in Vietnam, the cluster munition site increased greatly. There are some sites increased more than 2,000% in comparison with the initial polygon. So we had to count the beneficiary at post date, but in the uh, standard uh, de definition, uh, it can be at uh, pre or post date. The standard beneficiary uh, definition also brings us the opportunities. It brings the consistency across operators and in the future with local and national authorities. Vietnam is building their My Action VU framework and they aim to align with the international standard. Uh, we hope that having the uh, SBD as the international standard will encourage the authority to apply it in the future. 
that is the end for my presentation. Thank you very much for your listening. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mai Chi. We'll have another example of uh, how these standards are being applied in the field. This time, um, uh, we will go to uh, Nukutenda, who um, joined Halo as a, um, in August uh, 2020. So she's uh, someone with new experience in Mine Action um, and who previously um, was working in social work. Um, and um, she's joining us from Halo Zimbabwe. Over to you, Noku. Oh, you're still muted. If you could just unmute so we can hear you. Oops, if you can just see it's on the, it's, it should be at the bottom of your screen, you should see a microphone if you can just unmute yourself or perhaps um, our colleague from Unmask can unmute her for her. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Noku, can you can you see where that um, mute button is at the bottom of the screen? Can you? Um, yeah, you can't manage to undo it, huh? You're having yeah. Okay. There was probably a bit of a technical glitch here uh, as well. Um, so why don't we uh, see if we can resolve this? Um, I'm not sure, perhaps, Nuku, if you go out and maybe come back in, maybe try another browser. Um, and while we're waiting for you to do that, um, I'll go on to our next uh, panelist in the meantime, and I'll come right back to you. How about that? OK, so um, let's go on um, to um, someone who I work with now, <laughs> Lionel Pechera. Who is, um, who is now a uh, Mine Action Standards Advisor with us at GICHD. And um, Lionel, um, just a couple of questions as to how you see the, this, um, the impact of this guide in the field. And maybe you could say a few words about, uh, about the IMAS as well, which has been men mentioned a few times. Over to you. Thank you very much, Tammy. A very interesting discussion. Uh, I would start as a, with a counter example. Uh, what happens when you don't have standardized definitions? Uh, it happened that uh, uh, I co-coordinated uh, mine action subsector in Northeast Nigeria. And uh, in the of standardized definitions, uh, planning, but also uh, reporting, uh, it is difficult to, uh, handle it, uh, to handle it in a current manner. It's a bit like uh, mixing uh, uh, apples and oranges and putting them in the same basket. The contrary from uh, the previous discussions uh, seems to be quite consensual from the donor side uh, and from uh, mine action organization side that when it exists, when it is implemented, uh, it adds values and uh, supports planning and thus funding, monitoring, reporting this again planning and at the end uh, accountability uh, towards beneficiaries so um, in order to consolidate these uh, good practices uh, now the intent is logically uh, to capture these definitions so uh, def uh, definitions of beneficiaries but also definitions of uh, categories of land use uh, in the framework of international mine action standards. Uh, which, and, and these definitions uh, in that document are very detailed. So uh, it, it's pragmatic uh, and the guidance offered through there uh, would add values uh, to other aspects that are already covered uh, through the framework of uh, these IMAS. Land release, explosive ordnance disposal, explosive ordnance risk education, victim assistance. This is covered through victim assistance. We don't mention really beneficiaries in these IMS. We mention communities, communities at risk, but beneficiary doesn't uh, appear clearly. Also, the topic of uh, beneficiaries 
defining them and then being in position to uh, uh, measure them uh, relates to other management aspects which are also covered uh, within the framework of IMAS. Quality management, monitoring, evaluation, key performance indicators. Again, we are missing a bit about uh, beneficiaries. So the intent for the time being uh, is to consider uh, um, the definition of beneficiaries and categories of long use as a specific set of information. And to include these definitions within IMAS 510, which is dedicated to information management uh, within mine action. Uh, especially, uh, the focus will be on Annex B uh, to IMAS 510, uh, which is a normative annex uh, on minimum data requirements. From there, um, of course, it is a process. Uh, it will have to be elaborated. It will have to be proposed to the IMAS review board. Uh, but if the process goes well, if it is accepted, uh, it will offer national mine action authorities uh, the, the, the possibility to take ownership of these uh, definitions and to adapt the guidance uh, to their own national standards. Over. Thanks so much, Lionel. It's good to have that um, reminder on what's in UNMAS and not. I noticed that uh, some of the panelists are responding in the chat uh, to questions, and I would encourage you to do that just because we, we are short for time. Um, I noticed that there was a, a question on counting beneficiaries of mass media. So if anyone would like to weigh in on that uh, in the chat, uh, if we have time, we'll, we'll go to you live. But um, um, the, the chat is an excellent way to get some of those responses out. So please continue doing that. And I see we have no coup back among us. Um, I wonder if you're able to uh, to unmute now. Uh, is that going to work for you? Still not, huh? OK. Well, um, we'll have to try and um, get our thinking caps on how we can solve this. But um, um, for the moment, um, I guess um, we, will, we will go to the next uh, questions uh, which relate to the next steps actually in this process and um, maybe I could start out uh, with you Laurie and then I would like to go to Cambodia to talk about their example of how their how they see the guide and uh, what next steps uh, will be uh, planned in Cambodia. So maybe over to you Laurie to start off um, and uh, I guess I haven't introduced you yet um, of course, uh, you are the Armed Violence Reduction uh, Program Development Officer, sorry, working with Handicap International uh, from uh, Montreal, um, which where I also did my studies. So uh, good, good, good uh, work there. And um, you joined HI as the Global Risk Education Advisor. So, so you've got a lot of well-rounded experience from HI. Over to you, please. All right, thank you, Tammy. Can you hear me well? Uh, since I've put the camera on, the internet is really slow. Loud and clear. Confirm it's good? Yeah. All right, okay, stop me if, it's, uh, if it goes uh, weird. All right, so thank you everyone for being here today. It's a pleasure to, to be part of this discussion. And for me, this the entire discussion is really interesting uh, to follow because we've seen how the standardizing beneficiary definition uh, have come to give us a way to talk together, you know, a common language, and it was so needed and it's so satisfying to see that we have those clear guidelines now. So of course, now that it's done and we're, you know, there's something to be happy about, we can already think what next, you know? So the standardizing beneficiary definition, it successfully framed our work so that beneficiaries and communities supported remain at the very core of what we do. So based on that, uh, a group of operators, so HI, MAG, NPN, HALO, have started to reflect on another crucial and related topic, uh, which is the one of beneficiary identification, selection, and the prioritization of task. Um, we have been noting that uh, in the current HMA context, operators, they might not always feel like they have much to do, you know, uh, to about where to clear land next, or which beneficiaries to choose really, because we have to take for account security concerns, logistics uh, concerns, the donor requirements, and we do receive task orders from the National Mine Action Authorities, and it is our job to fulfill them. So within that, we feel sometimes our, our hands are tied a little bit. But we have to remind ourselves that 
even under such restrictions in brackets, we don't only have the agency, but we have the responsibility to do the best we can to reach the right people at the right time. So this is why we have been asking ourselves, are we sure that we are leaving no one behind? Are we sure that the activities we implement are organized correctly? Are we going about this in a coherent way from an operator? Um, so knowing this, of course, we did what we know best. <laughs> we started drafting another document, another concept note. I don't know exactly how to. Um, and the paper is simple. Uh, with the standardizing beneficiary def definition, we have had a solid approach you know, we, uh, to look at how our work downstream should look like, you know, all the way down to the beneficiaries, to the people that matter. We now have a common language. What we don't have is a common language on the upstream of all of this, at the inception, assessment, and design phase. Um, how to identify the beneficiary really in the population, how to prioritize our work, or we have so many activities to implement. Uh, so all of that, you know, we need to look at. Um, so we've been identifying already a couple of principles to guide us in that reflection. I'll go really quickly. Um, so we, we are convinced that we have to foster participation, inclusion, and accountability, that our work should be conflict sensitive, and that our work should be linked better with other sectors. Um, so that means that when I am at the very beginning of my program, the pro and I am prioritizing my tasks, it's not just in the moment. I need to make sure all down the line that there'll be good connections with the other sectors, with the nexus even. Um, so of course, uh, this can be intimidating because it's very theoretical, but we are in the process of looking at how to make the practical standards just as useful as the standardizing beneficiary definition. And you will hear from us because we're just started um, and we will be so excited to have your feedback and you know, make this an another useful tool. Um, so I hope, uh, Katerina, this you know shows you a bit uh, what next to be done in terms of improvement uh, of the SDBs. I think we need to think at before and all down the line. Um, so that's it for me. Thank you. Thanks, Laurie. I wonder if you wanted to say anything on the on the those Washington Group questions um, and the issues behind uh, trying to capture data for disability. No, of course, I'll go really quickly. I mean, it's the same challenge. Initially, it was about gender and age. Now we've managed. Uh, so it's just about training. It's about putting in the effort, I think, um, you know, re re uh, rethinking our database. Um, so at HI, uh, you know, we readjust those questions to the context. Uh, we train all of our meal teams, all of our staff, and then they go about because we have different sectors, of course, of intervention. Uh, but all of them are trained into asking those questions in a way that's, you know, uh, suitable um, and then it feeds into the database as a routine process uh, so it's just about making that extra step um, and adjusting to the context as a very short uh, short answer thanks so much laurie that's uh, much appreciated um now i would like to uh hand over uh, to his excellency lee panarit who represents uh, cambodia as mine action authority uh, if I could hand over to you for a few thoughts on um, what this um, standard beneficiaries guide means to Cambodia and uh, what the next steps are that you're thinking of putting in place. Over to you. Thank you, Tammy. Uh, please let me know if you cannot hear me clearly. Loud and clear. You're good. All right. Uh, we say that we embrace a people-centered and needs-driven approach to carry out my action activities. Yet, defining targeted people and their needs differ from country to country, and sometimes even from donor to donor. This is indeed a challenge if you aim to advocate for mine action, for example, by linking mine action with donors' priority as well as the sustainable development goals. In this respect, and since there are many international and national mine action standards, there should be also a standard for beneficiary definition. In Cambodia, the beneficiary definition of mine clearance is more elaborated than explosive ordnance risk education, uh, victim assistance, and explosive ordnance disposal. Under the planning and prioritization guidelines for mine clearance, the direct and indirect beneficiaries are differentiated by intended land use, like housing, agriculture, historical site, pagoda, just to name a few. 
However, we keep exploring if we can further make it less ambiguous in defining the indirect beneficiaries. As such, we can tap into the best practices documented in the second edition of standardizing beneficiary definition to improve our beneficiary definition, not only for explosive online risk education with team assistance and explosive online disposal, but also for mine clearance. Now, with NPA support, the document is being translated into Khmer language. Next, CMA will lead a, consult a stakeholder consultation to discuss how to make best use of this document. Thank you. Back to you, Tammy. Thank you so much, Rit, for that. Uh, that's very helpful, very precise. So thank you uh, very much. Um, I guess we unfortunately are still not able to um, to get Nuku on board. Um, and so we have a couple of minutes. Um, I'm wondering, um, we, we had on the list that UNMAS and ICRC were going to uh, make uh, 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 some interventions from the quote-unquote floor. So perhaps uh, I see Abigail uh, Hartley is there uh, from UNMAS, and perhaps I can hand over to you to, to make a statement, Abby. Thank you very much, Tammy. Thank you. And thank you to everybody who's been on this panel. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of the Interagency Coordination Group for Mine Action, and I would like to um, make clear that the UN supports efforts um, made towards standardising beneficiary definitions, and we have contributed to the consultation process. Um, it's for sure the mine action sector and all those living in contaminated areas stand to gain from harmonizing our understanding of beneficiaries. So we look forward to this process being taken up by the IMAS Review Board, um, which some of you will know I'm privileged to chair. And although we are waiting for the IMAS Steering Group to approve our work plan, um, which will happen in the next weeks, we have suggested this as an area of focus work and I'm, I'm confident that the Steering Group will support us. So we do hope that through the IMAS process, consultations will benefit from the voices and perspectives of national authorities, uh, donor countries, uh, national NGOs. Um, and I think that that will only bring increased um, harmonization and um, yeah, consolidation of, of this amazing and really great work that's been uh, started and spearheaded and well done to Sebastian and his colleagues. Um, and thank you, um, from all of the ICG for arranging this event. We're grateful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Abigail. It, it, it's, uh, it's good that support uh, uh, from UNMAS and a clarity on that support, which is a similar position to, to GICHD on this. We're sort of supporting from the wings, so to speak, and hopefully um, we'll be involved in the uh, discussions in uh, IMAS in terms of bringing this guidance into, into that format. So thank you for that. Um, I wonder if, um, since it looks like, I'm not sure if ICRC uh, can actually uh, get on the mic, but um, as we wait uh, for them, I will just um, um, I will just highlight that some people are going to have to go uh, quickly or slightly before the end of this side event, just because there there is a, a panel starting uh, right at 5.30. And so um, and we will end up having to end at, at 5.30 sharp. Um, so thank you for, for all of you, to all of you who've, uh, who've logged on and, uh, and, and born with us through some of our technical difficulties. Um, I wonder if, um, as we're waiting for Lou, we could um, look at some of these questions. Um, if, uh, if I could throw out to any of the panelists who wanted to, to talk about it, um, whether um, the, some of the issues behind, um, for example, um, explosive ordnance risk education and uh, counting uh, indirect or direct beneficiaries from mass media, that is an issue that is uh, one of the areas of difference with IMAS. And uh, I wonder if anybody would like to speak to that. Um, do I see you, Maichi, uh, leaning into your microphone? Uh, perhaps we could get you to, to tell us what, how you do things in Vietnam in terms of mass media, if you do that? In Vietnam, uh, we do not uh, 
have uh, mass media at the moment, but we are going to have the uh, social media in the coming months. Uh, we have the Facebook, uh, the digital EOIE, and uh, we count the beneficiary based on the, because the, uh, we have the um, summaries of Facebook on the ones who since the advertisement from our digital EOIE and who click on the, the messages, et cetera. So we can count from the social media uh, from uh, the summary. But um, we do not have experience on the, um, uh, like the TV show or anything like that. Yes, thank you, Maichin. I think that the, the issue does turn around the fact that in some cases you are able to uh, count uh, if, if you've got certain types of mass media. Um, but maybe I can hand over to Shafi. Did you want to say a couple of words on that quickly? I saw you were on the chat on this issue. Yes, thank you very much, Sammy. Uh, I believe it, it's very critical that, that we understand uh, how difficult it is to measure audience of mass media, uh, even uh, if it is Facebook, because amongst the social media, Facebook uh, gives, gives the most detail analytics on who viewed uh, our post, where from, what time, age, and all, all that demographics. But, but it could be that somebody likes a post because they like the content, not necessarily because they are affected or, or, or uh, live near uh, explosive ordinances. Uh, uh, similarly, with, with radio and, and TV, it could be that, that many people are reached, but it, then it, it could be that they are not affected and they are not interested in it. So unless and until we can control that variable, it, it is very problematic to, to measure those beneficiaries because, because it, it will impact on, on future uh, prioritization and, and future planning. Um, uh, for instance, if we have a community with thousand odd people that live near explosive ordinances, and, and through mass media or through TV or, or, or public service announcements, we reach around 600 people. Uh, that is the metric, 600 people, but uh, it could be that only a handful, two or three uh, of those people uh, were amongst those um, th that, that were affected and, and th those that benefited from it. And, and there is again uh, the, the problem of, of the uh, inferred message versus the intended message because it's one-way communication we can't be certain while it is good to have mass media to to pass on risk education i don't think we we can rely on that okay thank well thank you very much uh, shafi i think we will have to wrap up now um i noticed that uh, nuku has uh, extended her apologies for the technical difficulties but i i'm i extend my apologies to you nuku we really would have liked to have heard from you so uh, apologies uh, for not hearing uh, the case of nuku zimbabwe um but i do thank um, all the panelists who've contributed to this event. Um, I think there are still things to, to discuss as we move forward with um, discussions and uh, move into the IMAS uh, format. Um, but I think that this, this document is really a step forward and I would definitely commend the organizations that have come together to work together, as Sebastian said, um, in order to, uh, to, to try and move forward the sector. So thank you very much to all of you who are still with us. And um, I assume many of you will want to uh, go to the next panels. So I will let you get on with that and wish you, well, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you're coming to us from. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you, Tammy. Have a great day, everyone. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye.